Well, uh, hello and, and welcome uh, to, to all of you. Uh, it is uh, fantastic to, to know that, uh, that we're, we're able to, to have, this, uh, have this conference, have this panel. I know that we've all been Zooming quite a bit over the past year, but, uh, but it is uh, you know, something that works out uh, very well, I think, for discussions and, um, uh, and for, for getting some good conversations going about, uh, about topics like the one we're, we're discussing today. So today's panel, Conflicted Histories, Midwestern Indian uh, Struggles Over Identity and Sovereignty in the Early Republic uh, has uh, three panelists uh, that I will introduce uh, in turn. I'm gonna go in, in order of, of how uh, they were listed on the, the program. Um, just as a quick means of introduction myself, I'm uh, John Bowes. I am a professor of history at Eastern Kentucky University. So uh, I am zooming in from good old Richmond, Kentucky. Uh, our first presenter uh, is Aaron Lutke. Uh, who recently received his PhD in history from Michigan State University. Uh, his dissertation entitled Writing Against the Frontier, Contested Memory and Indigenous Counter-Narratives in the 19th Century explores the ways in which settler, settler colonialists not only physically dispossessed Great Lakes Indians throughout the 19th century, but also wrote them out of existence as they constructed official narratives that glorified their own pioneer roots while perpetuating myths of vanishing Indians and indigenous inferiority. However, throughout the 19th century, Great Lakes Indians evolved numerous tactics of adaptive resistance to thwart the violence of dispossession, and they disproved the myths of their inferiority and disappearance by writing their own narratives and of survivors. Uh, Aaron will begin a postdoc at University of Michigan in June, so just right around the corner, fantastic, in, in good old Ann Arbor. Uh, in the newly created Research for Indigenous Social Action and Equity Center. Uh, Aaron also has a chapter in the forthcoming edited volume, The Northern Midwest and the U.S.-Canadian Borderlands. So Aaron, I hand the, the microphone over to you. Thank you so much, John. Okay. In August of 1796, Wabakanin, the aging head chief of the Mississauga Indians in Upper Canada, traveled with his wife, his sister, and an entourage of other Mississauga to the town of York, present day Toronto, to sell some salmon to British settlers. Late in the evening, Wabakanin's wife woke him as a British soldier with the Queen's Rangers named Charles McEwen was attempting to kidnap the old chief's sister. McEwen claimed earlier that he had paid the woman for sex and he had come to collect. When Wabakinin had intervened, McEwen picked up a large stone, caved in his skull and kicked him until he stopped moving. Wabakinin did not die immediately. He and his wife, who was also assaulted, both passed of their injuries in the ensuing days. Realizing the potential for large-scale retaliation by the Mississauga and other indigenous groups, Acting Lieutenant Governor Peter Russell responded quickly by ordering McEwen tried for murder. However, the Mississauga who witnessed the attack failed to attend the trial, and McEwen was exonerated for want of evidence against him. Wabakinin's murder sent shockwaves throughout Upper Canada. In the ensuing months, Indians throughout Upper Canada rallied around cries of rebellion. They initially threatened warfare and violence, especially after the trial, but were somewhat mollified when Russell awarded presents to cover Wabakinin's death. This event was critical for two reasons. In 1796, York was the capital of Upper Canada. As such, administrators acknowledged its importance to the geopolitical stability of the region. Secondly, the Mississauga Indians, an offshoot of the Northern Ojibwa of Lake Superior and Huron, were crucial allies to the British at a time when a potential second war with the United States loomed on the horizon. Wabakinin was particularly crucial in Mississauga's relations with the British, as he frequently served as an intercultural broker between the two peoples. Wabakinin's importance to the British began during the Revolutionary War when he traveled throughout the Great Lakes to help recruit Anishinaabe warriors to fight alongside their British allies. In 
In 1784, Wabakinin signed a document that ceded the Niagara Peninsula to the British government so that homes might be established for loyalist and Mohawk refugees displaced by the Revolutionary War. Three years later, he attended a council meeting between the Mississauga and British administrators at the Bay of Kent, wherein the infamous Toronto Purchase allegedly took place. This resulted in a blank deed that effectively ceded the British, the crucial strip of land that became York and later Toronto. Wabakinin also surrendered an additional 3,500 3, acres of Mississauga lands to the British government in 1795, which was used to reward the famed Mohawk leader, Joseph Brandt, for his exemplary service in the Revolutionary War. Wabakinin and his Mississauga supporters believed that a strong alliance with the British, even at the cost of much of their lands, was the only way to protect them from the land-hungry American settlers that threatened the entire Great Lakes region. However, when newcomers spread across Upper Canada in the late 18th century, their behavior mirrored those of American settlers. Relations between Mississauga and British settlers, farmers, soldiers, and administrators grew increasingly strained throughout the last two decades of the 18th century. Incidents of violence, such as the one that resulted in Wabakinin's murder, continued to threaten the tenuous peace that the two groups had worked so hard to maintain. This presentation discusses the effects of settler colonialism in Upper Canada, or present-day Ontario, throughout the late 18th and early 19th century. This region saw a tremendous amount of change in the decades between the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812. The continual conflict throughout this era split allegiances in both British and Indigenous societies. However, savvy Indigenous people capitalized on the conflicts to create a buffer zone throughout the Great Lakes where they could play the British and Americans off of one another in order to maintain a measure of sovereignty and autonomy. Such opportunities began to dwindle, though, after the War of 1812. British and U.S. officials drew a hardened border that split the region in two. This border disrupted the cultural continuity that had connected indigenous communities who traditionally traveled throughout the Great Lakes in accordance with seasonal agricultural, fishing, hunting, and other cultural practices. Once this border solidified, settler societies on either side of it increased their encroachment on indigenous lands when they gained the full protection of their respective imperial administrations. Political representatives of both Britain and the United States applied pressure on indigenous communities to cede more and more lands desired by settler populations. However, indigenous communities responded in creative ways. Influenced first by Mohawk leader, Joseph Brandt, and then later by their own chief and Methodist minister, Peter Jones, the Mississauga Indians of Upper Canada were able to employ strategies of adaptive resistance to stymie the effects of settler colonialism and ultimately to avoid complete dispossession and removal in the turbulent 1830s. The Mississauga who came to inhabit the future colony of Upper Canada were originally descended from the Ojibwa of the Northern Great Lakes. Throughout the 18th century, the Mississauga claimed control of a territory that stretched from the St. Lawrence River in the east to Lake Huron in the west and encompassed the lands north of Lakes Erie and Ontario. Iroquoian peoples, the Huron, Erie, and Neutral, first occupied this territory, but the Haudenosaunee, or Five Nations Iroquois Confederacy, laid claim to it after a long and bloody invasion in the mid-17th century. After an equally bloody counter-invasion, the Anishinaabe peoples of the Eastern Great Lakes forced the Haudenosaunee to sue for peace, relinquishing their rights to these lands in the Great Peace of Montreal in 1701. Following this peace treaty, the Mississauga split from their northern Ojibwa moved east and took control over the vacated lands in the region. Though the Haudenosaunee and Mississauga had harbored a century's worth of animosity toward one another, the Revolutionary War provided an opportunity for reconciliation. This region was long characterized by distrust and cultural differences, but encroaching American settlers provided a common enemy to Great Lakes Indians. In this context, the enigmatic Mohawk leader, Joseph Brandt, provided the diplomatic glue that established common ground for the Haudenosaunee, Mississauga, 
and British administrators. Brandt served as a crucial intercultural intermediary between the Mississauga and the British Indian Department, much as he had done once for the Haudenosaunee and the colonial, colonial official William Johnson before the revolution. After the war's conclusion, the Mississauga welcomed Brandt's Mohawk into Upper Canada by ceding the Niagara Peninsula to the British government to be awarded to Brandt and his followers. Once settled, once settled along the Grand River, Brandt considered himself a neighbor and ally to the Mississauga. He then used his influence and understanding of British diplomacy and land rights to slow the rate of sessions from the Mississauga to the British. In May of 1784, when Mississauga chief Poquan welcomed the new refugee Haudenosaunee, he spoke of them as one people stating, quote, we are Indians and consider ourselves and the Six Nations to be one and the same people and agreeable to a former and mutual agreement, we are bound to help each other, end quote. Poquan specifically identified Joseph as brother Captain Brandt, and he expressed the Mississauga's happiness at having the Haudenosaunee settle near them on the Grand River. Poquan simultaneously warned the refugees to keep tight control over their young warriors, stating, quote, we hope you will keep your young men in good order as we shall be in one neighborhood and to live in friendship with each other as brethren ought to do, end quote. It was clear that the Mississauga had hoped to benefit from Brandt's diplomatic abilities and from his clout with the British colonial administration. Brandt was responding to a succession of dubious Mississauga land surrenders in 1781, 1783, 84, 87, and 88 that opened Upper Canada to waves of incoming settlers, mostly British loyalists and Revolutionary War veterans, who constantly harassed and abused the region's indigenous inhabitants. These sessions became legally binding when the Mississauga signed the Between the Lakes Treaty in 1792. Throughout the 1790s, when the implications of these land surrenders became clear, the Mississauga began to voice their discontent to both the Haudenosaunee and to British officials. Joseph Brandt served as an intermediary between the Mississauga and the British, and in 1796, he was chosen by the Mississauga to replace the, the murdered Wabaikinin as chief. He increasingly served as the Mississauga spokesman to the British because as they stated, quote, he alone knows the value of the land, end quote. In fact, upon hearing news of Wabakanin's murder, the enraged Mississauga initially wanted open war with the British, and they did not relent until they were advised to by Brandt. By the time he was appointed chief of the Mississauga, Joseph Brandt already had a lifetime's worth of knowledge and understanding of intercultural diplomacy and Western notions of education, civilization, Christianity, land usage, and private property. Brandt, or Tayen de Nguia, was born to a prominent Mohawk family at Cuyahoga near present-day Akron, Ohio, around 1743. His biological father was a celebrated warrior, but little else is known about him. Brandt's stepfather, Nikas Brandt, or Eragiadeka, shows up in several records as the principal chief for the Mohawk at their castle of Konajahari in the Mohawk Valley. Brandt's sister, Molly, served as one of the most influential indigenous peoples throughout the second half of the 19th century, and her influence directly bolstered her brother's rise to power. Together, the Brandt siblings evolved a diplomatic relationship with the British that positioned the Mohawk as the most prominent indigenous group to the empire's colonial ambitions in North America. Throughout his life, Joseph Brandt leveraged his status among the British to protect his Mohawk community from settler encroachment and dispossession. Brandt adapted a strategy to resist the effects of settler colonialism based on a working knowledge of Western notions of land usage and private property. Brandt's actions reveal an understanding that the key to resisting imperial domination and settler encroachment was the ability to claim a legitimate right to land ownership. Brandt continually illustrated the fact that indigenous people could improve and better their lands according to Western standards, and thus they were deserving of the government's protection, just like settlers. <laughs> 
Brandt continually asserted Mohawk rights through legal channels, challenging encroaching settlers and surveyors with petitions and lawsuits. He also incessantly fostered the notion, first among the British and then the US Indian departments, that the Mohawk were the key to diplomacy with all other indigenous groups along the Western frontier. The Brants clearly understood that so long as the colonial administrators believed in the Mohawk's importance, they could make demands that ensured their community's protection and survivance. After Wabakanin's death, Brant's appointment as a Mississauga chief illustrated the success of these strategies. In a letter to Detroit fur trader John Askin, a justice of, in Upper Canada named William Drummer Powell recognized the political power that Brant had accumulated, especially as, quote, the Mississaugas who own the territory between York and Western population of the province have adopted him in the place of their great chief Wabakanin, who was murdered, it is supposed, by some rangers, end quote. Powell, Askin, other settlers along this Western frontier felt extremely threatened by Joseph Brandt. Brandt eventually died in 1807. However, before he did, he firmly established his successors, both within his own Mohawk community at Grand River and also within the Mississauga. In the 1790s, Brandt used his patronage to secure important positions and land deeds for his friends and associates, notably Augustus Jones, a British surveyor who had befriended many of the Mohawk and Mississauga around the western edge of Lake Ontario. Augustus Jones had two Indian wives, Sarah Takara Hogan, daughter of Mohawk chief Henry Takara Hogan, and Tuba Nenikwe, daughter of Mississauga chief Wabanose. Both wives pro provided Jones with children. His first son by Tubanenikwe, he named Tayenegeg, after Joseph Brandt. Their second son, Peter, or Kakawakwanabi, born in 1802, grew to become one of the most important chiefs of the Mississauga during the turbulent era of removal and dispossession. Peter Jones was raised Mo uh, Mississauga by his mother and her relatives until the region was ravaged during the War of 1812. By then, the Mississauga had effectively ceded the majority of their lands around Lake Ontario and British settlers and war veterans quickly flooded in. Following the war, Jones's father, Augustus, took, in two of, took, in, took his two sons and moved them all onto the Grand River Mohawk Reserve, where he owned a considerable homestead thanks to Brandt's patronage. There, Peter and his brother learned several Iroquoian cultural traditions, as well as Western agricultural practices. Peter also attended a formal school where he became both fluent and literate in English and Iroquois. In this time at the Grand River Reserve, Peter witnessed firsthand the effectiveness of Brandt's strategies of creative adaptation. In 1823, after he converted to Christianity at a Methodist camp meeting, Peter began his career as a minister. Because Jones's Christianization seemed directly in line with the British Indian Department's policies of indigenous civilization and uplift, he constantly received support of Upper Canada's colonial administration. In the summer of 1826, Jones and his Mississauga followers established a mission village at the mouth of the Credit River, just west of Toronto. At a time when the Mississauga experienced tremendous poverty, famine, and population loss, Jones offered hope. Over the next four years, he earned the respect of his people, and in 1829, he was appointed chief and primary spokesman in dealing with the British Indian Department. Similar to what Brandt had accomplished among the Mohawk at Grand River, Jones encouraged his people to adopt Western farming practices and education. Through Christianization and a, an adaptation to British cultural standards, Jones earned his people the esteem of the British Empire. Jones's settlement on the Credit River thrived in the 1830s. At this time, a series of successive appointments of British colonial officials in Upper Canada brought about a constant cycle of imperial policy reconsideration. Since the conclusion of the War of 1812, administrators continually sought to pare down the costs associated with the Indian Department. Britain came to view its indigenous allies less as sovereign powers and more as impoverished dependents, and thus a drain on the imperial coffers. Administrator after administrator proposed budget cuts to the department, but they almost all unanimously believed that through, quote, 
the instruction and education of their youth, end quote, the administration could enact a trickle up effect, civilizing the tribe similar to what occurred with the Mississauga at the credit reservation, who quote, showed every promise of success, end quote. <clears throat> This all changed in 1836 with the appointment of Sir Francis Bondhead as Upper Canada's Lieutenant Governor. <clears throat> Prior to his appointment, Bondhead had no experience in dealing with Indians of the Great Lakes. His interactions with indigenous peoples mostly occurred during his time as a mining supervisor in South America. However, in the late 1830s, Bondhead implemented his own version of an Indian removal policy. Bondhead saw settler populations as inherently corrupt and destructive to his romanticized notion of a pure indigenous people. He thus envisioned removal as a way to supposedly protect Canada's First Nations from the influences and advice of encroaching fur traders and settler colonists. On September 18th of 1836, Jones noted in his journal that the recently appointed Bonhead visited the Mississauga village on the Credit River during a tour of the Indian habitations of the province. <clears throat> According to Jones, after a thorough inspection of the many structures throughout the village, Bonhead, quote, said that the credit village was the cleanest, neatest, and most civilized of all the Indian settlements he had visited, and that he had now visited nearly the whole of them in this province, and expressed great satisfaction at what he had witnessed, end quote. Bonhead's response to the civilization progress of the credit mission echoed the consensus of other British officials, administrators, traders, and missionaries throughout the 1820s and 30s. However, Bonhead shortly after took it upon himself to halt the civilization policies that had characterized British Indian affairs in the two decades following the War of 1812. Instead, Bonhead proceeded to negotiate land sessions with various Ojibwe leaders for 23,000 islands in the Manitoulin chain in Lake Huron to serve as a preserve for Amerindian peoples that were displaced by territory sessions on the mainland of Upper Canada. Despite the fact that the Indians Bonhead negotiated with ceded millions of acres of arable land in exchange for a string of barren rocky islands, he still claimed throughout his life that his intentions were to protect indigenous peoples. While Bonhead successfully managed to relocate numerous indigenous communities throughout Upper Canada to the new reserves on Manitoulin Island, Jones and his Mississauga fought back. Initially, there were talks of an open rebellion, but like his predecessor, Brandt, Jones was able to convince his followers to seek a more peaceful resolution through Britain's legal channels. Jones sent a letter to his uncle and fellow Methodist minister, John Sunday, who happened to be in England at the time on a ministry tour. Jones informed him of the situation and asked him to apply for aid among Lon London's religious and political circles. Sunday appealed to two leading figures among the newly formed Aborigines Protection Society, Thomas Hodgkin and Sir Augustus de Estes, the Queen's cousin. These powerful friends invited Jones himself to travel to England in order to petition the Queen directly on behalf of his Mississauga community. There, Jones came across Britain's colonial secretary, Lord Glenig, one of Brandt's former allies in his many land battles with the British settlers and colonial administrators in Upper Canada. To Glenig, Jones expressed his anxiety that without a proper title, administrators like Bondhead would be able to manipulate the Mississauga out of their lands. Glenig, deeply impressed by Jones and the success of his Mississauga settlement, told him, quote, our forefathers, the ancient Britons, were once as barbarous as North American Indians are. And as Christianity has made our nation what it is, surely it will do the same for the Indian tribes." End quote. <clears throat> Glenig appreciated the Mississauga's progress, and he saw for them a hopeful future. With Glenig's help, Jones earned an official audience with Queen Victoria herself. Due to his oratory and with Glenig's recommendation, the Queen granted the Mississauga title to their land deeds. Like Joseph Brandt a generation before him, Peter Jones successfully utilized strategies of creative adaptation to avoid the destruction or dispossession of his people at a time when countless other indigenous groups faced forced removal and desolation brought on by disease and poverty 
both byproducts of settler colonialism. Jones, Jones's strategies maintained Mississauga culture, but they did so by adapting to both Haudenosaunee and British cultural practices. Jones found a sort of universal language of diplomacy in Christianity, and he was able to mobilize that language to the largest stage to plead for the rights of his people. Ultimately, Jones authored numerous works on Methodism and the Ojibwe people, most notably his autobiography and his History of the Ojibwe Indians. Like Brandt, Jones used his understanding of British standards and practices to prove that the Mississauga were every bit as human and deserving of their lands as British settlers. And like Brandt, Jones secured for his people a measure of survivance into the future. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, and I look forward to, to our conversation at the end of, uh, of, of this panel. Uh, our next presenter uh, is Michael Albany, uh, who is a PhD candidate at Michigan State University. He received his MA in history at Loyola University Chicago. And his dissertation is centered on Michelin Mackinac and the Anishinaabe women and their children of mixed descent who called that region home. Uh, in addition to his dissertation work, he is very involved in the digital humanities and other aspects of, of public history. And as a quick aside, I do have to say kudos to Michigan State University, uh, by the way, for the, uh, their website and the information that uh, both actually Aaron and, and Michael uh, are able to provide via that, that website. So truly kudos uh, to, to MSU. Um, but all that aside, um, uh, we're here to, to, to listen to Michael, and, and Michael's presentation is entitled An Indigenous Electorate, Anishinaabe Engagement with Electoral Politics in 19th Century Northern Michigan. So, Michael, the, the floor is yours. Okay, is my uh, screen visible there? All righty. In 1835, James Lawrence Schoolcraft hoped to serve as a delegate at Michigan's first constitutional convention, but he failed to be elected to the position by a razor thin margin, just two votes. Reflecting on his loss in a letter to his older brother, US Indian agent Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, he didn't mince words. Men were forced to vote against their wills, he alleged, and lies Barefaced lies were told to influence the ignorant. That his electoral downfall could result from the coercive and deceitful tactics he imagined led the younger schoolcraft to declare that Sault Ste. Marie, his family's base of operations in the Michigan territory where votes for him came up short, was, quote, by far a more degraded hole than it ever was in former years, end quote. Above all, Schoolcraft expressed frustration with, quote, some of the full-blood Indians or at best three-quarter breeds being allowed to vote, end quote. Making a claim like this, exuding with such scorn, seems somewhat peculiar, and not just because Schoolcraft's wife, Anna Maria Johnston, was a woman of both Native American and Euro-American descent. Just one decade earlier, it had been the electoral engagement of mixed ancestry peoples at Sault Ste. Marie that almost secured victory for one of his family's political allies. After the War of 1812, the US government claimed complete control over the Old Northwest, and it started laying the groundwork for settler colonial projects aimed at seizing the homelands of the Anishinaabe, that is the Odawa, Ojibwa, and Potawatomi peoples and transforming them into new states for Euro-American population. Although this undeniably presented the Anishinaabe with many new challenges, modern scholars of the American Midwest have become quicker to note that 1815 didn't instigate a period of unyielding decline for the region's indigenous inhabitants. Lakota scholar Jameson Sweet, for example, has recently demonstrated how a faction of politicians boasting Dakota heritage became instrumental actors in the Democratic Party of the Minnesota Territory. 
He argues, quote, mixed ancestry legislators quickly and easily took to American politics and political leadership. Their presence and power on the political landscape could not be ignored. And the influence of the so-called moccasin Democrats as a substantial potential voting bloc led directly to Indian citizenship in the upper Midwest, end quote. Despite how scholarship like Sweet signals a positive turn in the direction of Midwestern historiography, I contend that engagement with electoral politics remains one of the understudied ways in which Aboriginal groups contested American efforts to encroach upon their homelands throughout the 19th century. Thus, in this presentation, I have two objectives. First, I intend to showcase some of the preliminary findings from my ongoing research into how peoples of mixed Anishinaabe and Euro-American ancestry capitalized on their franchise to decisively impact several elections in 19th century Northern Michigan. Second, I plan to explain how mixed ancestry peoples could have come to view electoral engagement as a viable strategy for both promoting their interests and preserving the sovereignty of their indigenous kin. Uh, before I analyze any 19th century elections though, it's critical to examine the kind of space where the votes of mixed ancestry population could hold the greatest sway. Uh, and one such place is Bawit de Gong or Sault Ste. Marie. Located along the St. Mary's River that emptied uh, Lake Superior's waters into Lake Huron, but Wittagong was an Ojibwa gathering place and the site of economic and cultural exchange with the French, uh, with French and British fur traders. The U.S. government considers Sault Ste. Marie largely peripheral, with Henry Rowe Schoolcraft even comparing it to Siberia. Still, that didn't stop Lewis Cass, governor of Michigan's territory, uh, uh, excuse me, governor of the Michigan Territory from traveling there in 1820 with a detachment of U.S. soldiers to demand land upon which to construct a new American fort. One Ojibwe leader, Sasaba, wholeheartedly rejected the Americans' advances, asserting that his community should instead prioritize healthy relations with the British who remained nearby. Plus, an active military garrison could potentially make enough noise to scare away the fish that sustained the Ojibwe there. Sasabo and Cass nearly came to blows, and it was only the swift intervention of another Ojibwe leader, Ojgashkiaweke, that dispelled the tension. In the treaty that followed this conflict, the U.S. government secured a site for what had become Fort Brady. Meanwhile, the Ojibwe of Bawidagong retained a, quote, a perpetual right of fishing at the falls of St. Mary's and also a place of encampment upon the tract hereby seated, convenient to the fishing ground, end quote. This language underscores that even when the Anishinaabe ceded homelands in the 19th century, that didn't mean that they surrendered them. As the early 19th century U.S. government moved to consolidate control over areas where Americans ruled only on paper, negotiations across the Old Northwest regularly upheld the usufructuary rights of the Anishinaabe. Essentially, the U.S. government recognized that even after the Anishinaabe technically signed away rights to own and sell their homelands, they could continue to hunt, fish, gather, and as the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw specified, quote, enjoy the privilege of making sugar on ceded lands as they always had. Thus, it isn't wholly accurate to characterize these land session treaties as in and of themselves a sword that could cleave indigenous peoples clean from their homelands. Still, that didn't mean the US government didn't intend to weaponize these documents because buried within many of them were ticking time bombs. The aforementioned Treaty of Saginaw, for instance, specified that recognition of Anishinaabe use of fructuary rights could extend only, quote, while it, that being the ceded lands, continues the property of the United States. Likewise, the 1820 Treaty of Sault Ste. Marie detailed that the Ojibwa, quote, shall not interfere with the defenses of any military work which may be erected, nor any private rights. The U.S. government, therefore, wrote in to their diplomatic engagements ways to undercut 
how much land the Anishinaabe could continue utilizing by transferring indigenous lands from the public domain into the hands of private parties, reclassifying them as private property. And the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825 ushered in the arrival of New England settlers eager for private property. It was in this context that Anishinaabe throughout the Old Northwest began formulating strategies to remain in their homelands. Ultimately, indigenous peoples in what would become the state of Michigan didn't meet the same degree of state-sanctioned violence as other natives in the United States during the age of Indian removal. However, as historian John Bowes notes, quote, the evasion uh, of a forced relocation west of the Mississippi did not necessarily equal success or peace of mind, end quote. Anxiety over the prospect of forced removal was omnipresent, for even if the Anishinaabe in the Michigan Territory didn't face forced removal themselves, they could likely identify kin who had. Following the 1833 Treaty of Chicago, for instance, the U.S. government seized millions of acres of Anishinaabe land west of Lake Michigan and forced Potawatomi who lived there on a trail of death to reservations in Kansas and Oklahoma. The Potawatomi who successfully resisted removal were able to do so by establishing a Catholic community in what's present-day Dowagiac, Michigan. As the 19th century progressed, more Anishinaabe identified land ownership as a means to resist removal. The Grand Traverse Ojibwa purchased hundreds of acres of land, while the Little Traverse Odawa purchased 16,000 acres between 1844 and 1855. Meanwhile, the mixed ancestry kin of Sault Ste. Marie Ojibwa explored the potential of electoral engagement, perhaps most consequently, in the election for Michigan's territorial delegate to Congress. In 1825, there were three leading contenders for this position. Incumbent, Catholic priest Gabriel Richard, Austin Wing, and John Biddle. And John Biddle is the one who I want to focus on most here, because in terms of his understanding of indigenous peoples, we have a bit of evidence as to his thoughts, recorded in a discourse delivered before the Historical Society of Michigan, published in 1834. Biddle attests that, quote, before the light of civilization had dawned, where it had since shown with most brilliancy, the Indian probably launched his canoe upon our waters and erected his frail wigwam upon our shores, as he did in the age which immediately preceded us. Yet within the wide borders of this great empire, under various climates, in every variety of geographical position, he had not advanced one step beyond the rudest barbarism. When he leaves the soil to be succeeded by the descendants of the European, it seems fresh from the hands of nature." End quote. Within this quotation, I want to point out the telling use of the word when. Here we see that Biddle was intellectually of the belief that Native Americans were vanishing, and it wasn't a matter of if this happened, but indeed when. And one of the aspects of superiority for those of Euro-American descent was that they were able to have elements like the historical society and historical monuments that would leave memories of them long after they died. Nevertheless, uh, for indigenous peoples, he did not see that. So for someone like this, who supposed that life for Anishinaabe peoples in what would become the state of Michigan would ultimately end in them leaving, why was it that in a place like Sault Ste. Marie, he received a commanding portion of the vote, a commanding portion which in the first round of voting would seem to put him in the lead for this territorial delegate position uh, by a slim fraction. You see there with the numbers uh, after the first round of voting, he earned uh, 58 votes to three for Austin Wing in Sault Ste. Marie, and that pushed him to 731 votes 
over Austin Wing 724. One potential explanation is through Biddle's association with this man, Henry Rowe Schoolcraft. Schoolcraft was, as I mentioned before, an Indian agent who uh, was married into the Ojibwa community of Sault Ste. Marie through Jane Johnson Schoolcraft, daughter of the aforementioned Ogashkiaweke. It was through this connection that many peoples in Sault Ste. Marie may have been able to surmise that by having an ally of Henry Rose Schoolcraft, who in turn was related through kinship to one of their relatives, they could have gained some benefit from it. Nevertheless, after the election, which narrowly propelled Biddle to victory, there was immediate contestation. Austin Wing raised to the uh, Michigan government that there was a abundance of fraud in the election of 1825. And he based his claims on there being peoples of indigenous and quote, half-breed ancestry who were voting. He and his allies attested that there were people in the election who voted despite the fact that they quote, live in the habits of the entire Indians, that they are quote, married to Indian women of full blood and get their subsistence by fishing, their habits and mode of life. They are assimilated entirely to Indians of the full blood and have no habits in common with the white population. From this, we see a understanding of indigenous engagement uh, with American politics that was present in various treaty negotiations. The idea that the only folks of mixed ancestry who were entitled to any sort of benefit were those who had been quote unquote civilized. Civilization became related and uh, ultimately tied in to the ability to engage politically. Ultimately, Biddle and his allies, one of whom being Schoolcraft, never contested that the peoples of mixed indigenous ancestry uh, who voted in this election were not of mixed indigenous ancestry. Instead, they contested the quote unquote civilization of these peoples. From Henry Rose Schoolcraft, he asserted, quote, they are acquainted with the, pe the persons of mixed blood usually called half-breeds who voted at the late election for delegate to Congress at Sault Ste. Marie, that the said persons may be distinguished from the Indian nations to whom they are related by ties of blood in not relying upon the chance or means of clothing themselves and families in placing no dependence upon the spontaneous production of the earth for their subsistence, but in living in fixed residences or dwellings in working as laborers for hire and in adopting the maxims of civilized communities. This episode in which we see a back and forth between accusations of peoples of mixed ancestry either having the right to vote based on not being quote unquote civilized or having the right to vote based on their association with what Euro-Americans considered, considered civilization, it has been a subject of uh, analysis for some historians, but what few tend to focus on is that it wasn't just Euro-American actors who were involved in this back and forth. It wasn't just Euro-Americans who hoped to capitalize on peoples of indigenous ancestry for their votes. In fact, peoples of mixed indigenous ancestry responded themselves. One, Francis Dufault, who was regularly noted in the back and forth correspondence, uh, argued that he in fact did own a lot of land owned by his father on which the village now stands and that he had engaged in work and ultimately engaged in paying taxes. This therefore should entitle him to the right to vote. Another, 
John Piquet was involved in a petition that was sent to the uh, U.S. government on behalf of the residents of Sault Ste. Marie, uh, arguing that Wing's actions had, quote, deprived the people of their suffrages. From this, we can see that there was interest on behalf of peoples of indigenous ancestry to be involved in these in these mechanisms of governance. And one potential there was that they could have benefits gleaned from their associations with American elected officials. But one question that is raised by this is if the mixed ancestry peoples who were involved in this election which went to an ally of Henry Rose Schoolcraft, uh, saw him as their potential avenue uh, to benefit through his kinship ties with Jane Johnston Schoolcraft. Why, just a decade later, would his brother lose an election? One potential is that James Lawrence Schoolcraft uh, had to personal matters that led peoples at Sault Ste. Marie not to support him. He had a reputation as a drinker, as someone of violent tendencies, as someone who in fact had been jailed due to a fight uh, over a woman. And in fact, there's evidence that his own uh, indigenous kinship network didn't much care for him at all. When Anna Maria Johnston told her family that she had been smitten with James Schoolcraft, uh, they responded by uh, uh, forbidding her from seeing him and, in fact, beating her with a pair of fire tongs. He was that despised amongst them, at least initially. Nevertheless, there's also an aspect which historians Keith Witter and Gregory Evans, Evans Dowd discuss, that being the power of rumors. As early as 1834, rumors spread throughout the Old Northwest of the potential for forced removal. Francis Baraga noted this amongst the Indawas, uh, Odawas with whom he engaged, and uh, there was thought that perhaps Henry Rowe Schoolcraft would be a party to this. In fact, in the Treaty of 1836 in Washington, which ultimately led to the cession of most of the lands that would become the state of Michigan, there, there was uh, a major betrayal, it seemed, of many peoples at Sault Ste. Marie. As you can see on this chart, which details the uh, annuities paid to peoples of mixed ancestry as a result of the 1836 treaty, most of them are going to a single family, that of Henry Rowe Schoolcraft. In fact, of the uh, amount set aside, approximately $220,000 to be paid, 25% went to Schoolcraft and his relatives. We see in here then the potential that there was benefit for some indigenous peoples uh, through engagement with, uh, with Schoolcraft, that being his particular family members but not all. And so in 1835, unlike in 1825, the mixed ancestry peoples could have potentially decided that enough might have been enough. And that someone like Schoolcraft, who was uh, a Jacksonian, someone involved with the Democratic Party, would not ally with their interests most. In fact, in 1840, uh, we see that the 
demise of the Jacksonians came with the elections of the Whigs and the removal of Henry Rose Schoolcraft from his position and his replacement with Robert Stewart, who was a Whig who was vocally opposed to Indian removal. By this point, of course, removal had ceased to be a overarching uh, program that was most desired, largely because of panics in 1837. Nevertheless, there was a agent within the U.S. government who potentially did not see removal as the destiny of indigenous peoples. I'll conclude here simply by saying that through these brief uh, analyses, what I want to propose is that indigenous peoples and peoples of mixed ancestry in this period of the 19th century, uh, they were not as unaware of American electoral norms and systems as one might imagine. In the same way as an eminent scholar of this region remarked that between 1650 and 1815, the region was characterized by creative misunderstandings that led way to new understandings. After 1815, peoples of mixed ancestry had keen understandings of the electoral landscape they lived in. And this should give us a invitation to consider electoral engagement as a equally viable path that indigenous and mixed ancestry peoples could take along with ownership of land and other adaptive strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for, for that presentation. Um, uh, and without further ado, I'll move to uh, introduction of our last panelist, John Payton, who uh, is the organizer of this panel. So thank you, John, especially for your persistence over uh, this past year and a half of, of putting the panel together and, uh, and getting it uh, to, uh, to the conference. Uh, John is currently pursuing an, an MA in public history at Indiana, Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis. Uh, he uh, previously received his MA in history in 2019 from Indiana University and is currently engaged in two different uh, projects and work on, on two different projects. Um, one is titled Wild Horses Between Two Fires, Intertribal Factionalism in the Early National Ohio Valley. Uh, the second project is the focus of his presentation today and is entitled The Land We Have We Wish to Keep, Miami Autonomy and Resistance to Removal in Indiana, 1812 to 1826. So John, uh, the microphone is all yours. All right, thank you, Professor Bose. Um, the ability of Indiana tribes to resist removal, compel Euro-Americans onto their terms, and maintain a land base um, were best exemplified with the Miamis after the War of 1812 to 1826. Rather than become victims of dispossession, the Miamis reconstructed an identity riven by intertribal divisions that had both ignited conflict between Euro-Americans and Indians and brought destruction to the Miami homeland. By the war's close, they began reestablishing legitimacy by denouncing tribes whose actions threatened their homeland and reframing culture around traditional ideas about land and the memories of past divisions. Moreover, they benefited from the hegemonic leadership of Jean Baptiste Richardville, whose acumen as a traitor and the Miami's head chief helped the Miami's remain united. When meeting with the Miami's for land sessions in 1818 and 1826, officials faced a unified nation uh, whose lands could only be bought by meeting them on quote unquote native ground. Through treaties that reflected both cultural transformation and tribal tradition, Miami's articulated their sovereignty through Euro-American tools of indigenous subjugation, including surveying lands and American racial constructions of indigenous peoples. However, they also retained understandings of land that reflected the cultural and economic significance they had long placed on riverine areas that allowed them to facilitate trade. Thus, as the Miamis culturally regenerated after the War of 1812, they developed a variety of strategies that ultimately gave them an upper hand over 
officials intent on removing them. Conflict between Euro-Americans and Indians in the 1790s helped instigate a struggle over Miami identity that both divided and put Miamis at odds with Euro-Americans during the War of 1812. One faction under Little Turtle and his American son-in-law, William Wells, believed accommodating Euro-Americans by turning to their practices and customs was necessary for Miami's survival. Another led by Chief Pecan favored the persistence of a traditional Miami culture that had been cultivated with the French and later the British for nearly 150 years. With Prophet's Towns Incorporation in 1808, uh, Miami's openly opposed Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa's nativist rhetoric to protect their homeland and maintain peace between Indians and non-Indians, but their efforts had consequences. By 1812, most Miami leaders chose to remain neutral, yet supported William Wells' anti-nativist rhetoric because they did not want nativists to, quote unquote, bloody their ground. Rather than prevent bloodshed, Harrison attacked the Miami homeland because of the Miami's inability to control factions supported nativism. Factionalism within the Miamis allowed Harrison to justify the attacks he ordered on Miami villages. At the 1814 Greenville Treaty, Harrison told them the villages he ordered destroyed held corn that could supply, quote unquote, the hostile tribes with food while stating a few days later that the attacks were, quote unquote, attended again, solely against Tecumseh and that soldiers, quote, inadvertently, end quote, attacked Miami villages. Harrison was frustrated that these same Miamis who had so vehemently detested the prophet were unable to control, quote unquote, the licentious part of their tribe because this made them, uh, this made him unable to discriminate between friends and foes friends and foes, quote unquote. Miami's tried to mask their, inter their inability to control intertribal divisions them on their understanding of the conflict. At the treaty, Miami leaders victimized their tribes, arguing that the attacks Harrison ordered and US, British, nativist and nativist endeavors to lure them into the conflict had caused Miami division. Rather than admit to Harrison that the Miamis had long been divided, um, one of the Miami leaders, Captain Charlie, blamed, quote unquote, the great author of nature for embroiling them in the conflict and described the Miamis as a wild horse surrounded on every side by people endeavoring to catch him and kill him. Miami efforts to hide the reasons for intertribal division only made it increasingly more apparent and ultimately worked against them. Following the treaty, um, William Henry Harrison and Michigan Territorial Governor Lewis Cass even suggested removing neutral Miamis who would not move within white settlements to quote unquote, a place where they can do no injury. Ultimately masking their intertribal divisions under neutrality made Miami divisions readily apparent, led to the destruction of their villages and threatened them with removal. Though the 1814 Greenville Treaty exhibited Miami um, intertribal divisions to officials, it also inadvertently offered Miamis the opportunity to reclaim their sovereignty. In addition to excluding land sessions, the treaty, quote unquote, gave peace to the Miami that they had long been without since the incorporation of Prophetstown. It also recognized tribal boundaries, quote unquote, as they existed previously to the commencement of the war. By recognizing the legitimacy of boundaries and bringing um, Indians to the peace table, the 1814 Treaty of Greenville offered more concessions than limitations to the Miamis and provided the conditions the Miamis needed to persist and maintain hegemony. After the Greenville Treaty, Miamis denounced Potawatomi factions that had not made peace with the United States. Throughout 1814 and early 1815, prominent Miami leaders circulated rumors of impending Potawatomi attacks on white settlements. Miamis also alleged that Potawatomi stole several of their horses, were advised to attend the 1814 Greenville Treaty by the British in order to obtain munitions, and were regrouping on the Wabash to lure the Miamis into, quote unquote, their hostile Confederacy. Allegations like these allowed the Miamis to victimize themselves in the eyes of US officials while manipulating fears of another Indian resistance movement to their advantage. This allowed them to shift potential for violence to them. Settlement of the prophet's uh, followers following um, on Miami land after the War of 1812 also threatened Miami sovereignty 
and caused U.S. officials to come to terms with the Miami's newly reformed identity. Um, instead of kicking the followers off Miami land themselves, officials who now recognize the Miamis as a unified tribe considered them, quote unquote, the proper persons to order them on. In 1817, two Miami chiefs traveled to the followers settlements along the Tippecanoe River and told the, the quote unquote Prophets band they objected to their settlement because they did not want a village like Prophetstown to quote unquote, produce a similar distressing event between Indians and the United States. If the Prophets band refused to leave Miami land or became too large for the Miamis to order off, the Miamis would simply call on US officials to take care of the issue themselves. The Prophets band ended up leaving. The resistance strategies the Miami used against other Ohio Valley Indians were aided by the consolidation of tribal leadership after the War of 1812. Jean-Baptiste Richardville proved to be the most capable person for the job. A leader whom most officials either admired or despised, Richardville used his um, astute negotiating abilities to protect his people from the dispossession of their lands. Richardville's status as a Matisse also enabled him to navigate between French, British, indigenous, and American ethnicities, allowing him to more firmly unite Miami's under his leadership than his predecessors, while exploiting US officials to his nation's advantage. By 1818, officials fully realized the influence he held over Miami autonomy. Richardville first prepared to act on his people's behalf by reforming trade in the region. During the summer of 1815, Richardville purchased a trading house near the Fort Wayne garrison for, quote unquote, the purpose of carrying on a trade with the Indians. By December 1816, um, Richard Villas partners with Peter Langlois, a trader under British pay who ironically served in an Ohio militia detachment that attacked Miami villages in 1812. Richardville continued um, to pick up momentum from there. By the early 1820s, he had expanded his trade network to include Canada and much of the Great Lakes purchased a beautiful home in Indiana and become the wealthiest man in Indiana. Richardville's role as a trader allowed him to establish legitimacy as an autonomous leader. Instead of relying on American traders who sought to drive Indians into debt, Richardville um, established trade houses at important cultural centers near Miami villages where he provided the Miamis with the goods they wanted. Through these actions, Richardville regained the Miami's confidence in his leadership ability and kept his nation out of heavy debt, which officials wanted to use as a pretext for Miami removal. Instead of finding an excuse to kick the Miamis off their lands, officials found that Richardville quote unquote controls and directs the Miamis and quote unquote was everything in the nation. They could only gain land for white settlement by meeting the Miamis on a native ground he largely controlled. Richardville gained influence among his people and was able to protect Miami autonomy because his activities conformed to traditional Miami cultural constructions of land and the economic advantages he, he, it provided. His success as a trader and subsequent uh, rise to leadership was, continued, was contingent on rivering areas throughout the Western Great Lakes and their cultural and, eco and economic ethnogeographic significance on which all Miami life depended. Through lands uh, located along rivers, Miamis were culturally persist at the outset of land session treaties. The most central geographic feature dependent on the Miami's rivering system was the Wabash Miami Portage. A nine mile strip of land located at the headwaters of the Wabash, the portage offered an efficient route connecting the Gulf of Mexico to the Great Lakes via the St. Lawrence and Mississippi rivers. Um, and Europeans, Indians, and Americans had long vied for control over it. Just as rivers informed the, uh, the portage's significance to the Miamis, the portage determined the importance of other cultural and economic hubs within the Miami domain. By reforming their sovereignty around their traditional culture and protecting it from further devastation, the Miamis regained legitimacy and retained lands at the outset of treaties, even as officials gained Miami lands for white settlement the Miami's rearticulated influence caused them to meet with the Miami's on their terms or risk hindering indigenous possession and even their personal ambitions. The Miami's newfound sovereignty also allowed them to widen the scope of their resistance strategies to include understandings of Euro-American practices that ultimately adhered to their traditional culture. 
With their sovereignty now intact, the Miamis were prepared to meet with officials in a position of dipl diplomatic leverage, um, allowing them to retain their lands and persist into the removal era. By 1817, the Miamis had come full circle from a tribe divided by factionalism that could be used against them to a nation well prepared for the threat of removal. As officials prepared for a land session treaty with the Miamis at St. Mary's, Ohio um, in 1818, they began to realize the potential consequences of failing to meet the Miamis on their own quote unquote native ground. As a result, they dealt more liberally with the Miamis than any other tribe in the Ohio Valley. And while the Miamis continued to adhere to their tribal culture, they began to look to Euro-American customs for new ways of resisting the threat of dispossession. Officials spent over a year preparing for a land session treaty that was held at St. Mary's, Ohio in eight, October, 1818. All officials knew they would have to offer large concessions to the Miamis and to Richardville himself to get him on board with the idea. Even after agreeing to cede land, Richardville requested the government make quote unquote donations to other Miamis, including the heirs of prominent Miamis like William Wells. Officials also understood the necessity of winning over um, other Miami leaders with large concessions and knew that they quote unquote must all be attended to as we have no other way left us for getting Indian lands. Fort Wayne Indian agent Benjamin Stickney tried to discredit Richardville's influence by working with other Miamis who he thought were against him and in effect hindered the negotiating power of officials at the treaty. That summer, Stickney and Antoine Bondi, um, another Miami, uh, met with Cass at Detroit where Stickney informed him of his plan to quote unquote des destroy the influence of Richardville before the treaty. Cass did not sit idly by while the actions of one of his Indian agents jeopardized the whole negotiation. Instead, he told Richardville, and Stickney's um, attempts to incite division within the Miamis ultimately backfired. Miami chiefs under his influence who came to treat with officials in the fall made efforts to appear quote unquote proverbially perverse and obstinate when hammering out the treaty. Instead, Richard Bill and Mississippi chiefs walked out of the council and did not return until officials gave them the best possible deal and a spectacle one um, Indiana official, Benjamin Park, feared, quote unquote, may have an injurious influence on future negotiations. The conduct of the Mississippi chiefs during the negotiation signified a shift in the way Miami's understood land and its value. After the war, my, the Miamis began incorporating Euro-American property values into their own cultural constructions of land. In doing so, they transitioned from solely using strategies informed by tribal culture to maintaining their homeland through some of the same Euro-American land holding practices that were being used against them. After the War of 1812, Miami chiefs would sometimes accompany surveyors to, to ensure they were conveying, quote unquote, the correct information in their surveys. Rather than see the Miamis as a weak people, officials now acknowledge, quote unquote, a great revolution in the Miamis who had begun to view their land through Euro-American constructions. The boundaries established through individual land grants in the 1818 Treaty of St. Mary's, Miamis redefined their physical borders through understandings of Euro-American um, land holding practices that were still um, inherently linked to the broader Miami landscape. Grantees reserved lands along natural boundaries, quote unquote, including the Wabash, Mississinawa, Eel Rivers, and other important tributaries that had long served them as sources of power. At the same time, the plots were delineated by artificial boundaries, boundary or section lines. Each tract was connected to a riverine area in one way or another, either as a natural boundary or as a waterway extending into a plot. However, or regardless of how treaty lands were plotted and how much land was ceded, rivers provided the continuity that allowed the Miamis to stay on their homeland. The way Miami land grants were subdivided in the treaty reflected a status of belonging that incorporated kinship and Euro-American racial distinctions of Indians. The Miamis um, avoided division and asserted national identity at the treaty by articulating a widened scope of belonging, describing all Miamis as, quote unquote, Miamis by birth and their heirs, and by dividing their land through these broader definitions. Through this terminology, the Miami were able to retain more land than other tribes 
that had participated in the treaty, namely the Awea and the Potawatomi. Um, from 1819 to 1826, Miami understandings of treaty continued shaping boxes of indigenous subjugation into convenient tools to avoid removal. Officials spent the better part of seven years and incurred several um, thousand dollars in expenses they could barely afford to meet for Miami stipulations in the 1818 Treaty of St. Mary's. Comparatively, other regional tribes were not taken seriously by the U.S. government. Um, in the end, Miami adaptations developed since the War of 1812 ended up turning an intended removal treaty held along the Mississippi in 1826 into a difficult process for officials intent on quickly relocating them. The Miami's $18,400 annuity payment from the Treaty of St. Mary's proved to be a significant challenge. Still, officials made a concerted effort to follow through with that and other payments. Given immediate cutbacks on Indian affairs Congress had to make because of the Panic of 1819, officials fell short in their annuity payments to the Miamis, paying only $17,900 in 1819, $18,121 a year later, yet still um, paid the Miamis um, $18,679 in 1821 after the Miamis demanded a $279 reimbur reimbursement from the year before. Logistically, Miami annuities proved a, formid a formidable challenge since Miami settlements were scattered across Indiana. To make their, distri their distribution more feasible, officials invited Miamis to Fort Wayne to receive them since a large proportion of the Miami population resided there at that time. Um, the annuity allotted through the treaty also empowered um, the Miamis to demand unmet stipulations from previous negotiations in, 18, in June 1819, uh, Richardville and the Chief Charlie informed um, officials that the Miamis received only two installments of a 150 bushel salt annuity from the 1803 Treaty of Fort Wayne that had not been paid since 1810. Officials paid off the remaining annuity 10 months later. Like other policies, annuities thus became a tool of power. Rather than subjugate the Miamis to the United States, annuities provided a means of exerting the authority they continued to hold. Annuities from the treaty allowed the Miamis to exert authority over established boundaries, which usually involved um, constructing permanent housing, fencing in tracks, and preparing lands for farming. Between 1823 and 1824, Fort Wayne Indian agent John Hayes and his successor John Tipton reported respectively that the Miami uh, that Miami's paid contractors over $3,000 of their payments to build 21 houses and quote unquote, perhaps 80 or, or, or 90,000 rails for fencing in their lands around Fort Wayne. Additionally, Tipton observed throughout the mid 1820s that the Miami's paid contractors between four and $9 to, um, per acre to clear, plow and plant corn on their lands. Contrarily, annuity payments to the Delawares and Potawatomis exhibited the power officials held over them. Rather than make timely, timely payments at convenient locations, officials used their poverty, scattered, scattered state, and the likelihood of a quick removal as grounds for withholding payment. Under the Treaty of St. Mary's, the Delawares were allotted a $4,000 annuity and provisions to remove across the Mississippi within three years. The Potawatomis, whom officials considered, quote unquote, the poorest, the poorest, most improvident tribe were in danger of not receiving any annuities in 1820. Officials initially deemed it would be impossible since they were divided into small communities and because um, there would be no money left to run the agencies. The Potawatomis were eventually paid for 1820, but they clearly did not see themselves as a governmental priority. Each year they had to travel hundreds of miles to Detroit with no provisions to receive payment, which one chief complained was quote unquote, a trifle compared to the Miamis who quote unquote, received their annuities at their doors. More than any other aspect, these disparities um, demonstrated the preferential treatment of the Miamis over other tribes um, who were viewed as likely candidates for a quick removal. By 1826, officials had began preparing for um, another land session treaty with the Miamis and Potawatomis in hopes of quote unquote, extinguishing title to all the lands claimed by them within the state. Cass personally recommended appropriating $50,000 to pay the commissioners and to distribute goods among the Miami. Recounting Richardville's influence at the Treaty of St. Mary's, Cass still acknowledged that the Miamis, uh, quote unquote, own the country 
and knew, quote unquote, their feelings and experience on the value of the land. In the end, Miami accommodation at the Treaty of the Mississippi cost far more than the $50,000 Cass proposed and provided a framework for Miami persistence. Officials spent more than twice the proposed congressional amount on the treaty um, for the treaty on Miami goods alone, with over $31,000 given to them in cloth, blankets, and other utilitarian items. Additionally, the Miamis would receive annuities of $35,000 and $30,000 first two years under the treaty and 25,000 for each year thereafter. Miami has also received far more land than they had in previous negotiations. As a tribe, the Miamis received over 100 sections of land, most of which was um, consolidated at the villages of influential Miami chiefs along the, Miss the Wabash, Mississippi, and Eel Rivers. Individual um, tracts accounted for 20 and one quarter sections of land, which was given to Richardville, Francis Godfrey, as well as other leaders and their children. The 1826, um, well, before I get to this last section, um, I'm still developing it. Um, so I am, I am kind of uh, borrowing heavily from a land too good for Indians, just for the record. Um, the 1826. Uh, and, and John, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. It, we just got a, a notification that the breakout room is going to be closing in about 50 seconds. So I didn't, I didn't want you to vanish into thin air. Um, while so, if if you have any final thoughts, um, sorry to uh, break in like that. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just do the conclusion. Uh, 14 years of Miami history from 1812 to 1826. Thus, should not be. Um, simply viewed as a precedent to the removal era rather than rather the Miami experience in these years should be viewed as part of a continuum of indigenous um, of individual indigenous histories in the early republic that help us better understand the